Yeah. Well, I think uh, there's a general interest in going on with what we were doing uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, and, and as the program suggests, continuing with uh, the small groups. Uh, I want to remind people that to be sure that somebody takes notes on the proceedings of each of the small groups, so we can discuss them at the larger group in the afternoon. Now, <coughs> the um, uh, so one point perhaps we could begin if somebody wants to make any further uh, comments on what happened or you know yeah, yeah. Um, I was listening to people um, in a casual setting since we since our last meeting last night and yesterday afternoon and it, it uh, sounded to me like people had different opposing views as to what kind of thing was taking place here and what was being discussed. And of course, there's always a tendency to uh, listen to that and say, well, gee, these people aren't hearing properly. And of course, I am. And, um, <laughs> and then I looked at that. But um, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. That's what I saw. Yes, as a, as a, it's not quite natural that different people will have different impressions of the whole thing. Uh, this is a, the whole point eventually in a dialogue if we or in communication, then we could come to a common meaning. Uh, and that common meaning would be a common mind. I say, say in view of what I was saying about meaning is being, uh, a, a set of different meanings, all different among people, means a set of different minds, right? <laughs> hmm? yes. And if we have one pool of meaning, we have one mind. You see, uh, the uh, because the meaning is active, it is not merely you know, sort of abstract, right? And mental, and uh, uh, see, I, I'd like to make a comparison. See, you may have a crowd of people, everybody going in his own direction, coming into conflict, and so on. Or you could imagine a ballet dancer, all are moving from a common pool of meaning. But of course, that's still a limited analogy because the score of the dance is fixed, right? You see, if we uh, <laughs> uh, compare this to an improvised ballet dance. <laughs> Uh, it would be a better analogy uh, to say that, that, therefore, the dialogue is an art, you see, as somebody said yesterday. And, uh, yes? Yes, may I say, I'm, I myself am a musician, a classical musician, and may I say that in <clears throat> playing music in, analogous to the dance, that um, although the score and the notes and the fingering or whatever may be fixed, mm -hmm. the experience of it in the moment is completely new. That's why it is a recreation, because it isn't something which is what, you know, I can go and play the same piece the next day, and it's completely a new experience, although the, the mm -hmm. notes are fixed. Yes, that, that's, that's, uh, that's right. You see, uh, uh, but I want to say that the, the, the dialogue, in, in a sense, has all that, but in addition, the notes are not fixed, you see. Yeah. <laughs> um, you see, that we want to... For the fixed assumptions would be almost like fixing the themes. And you see, within, uh, but you always have room within that theme. But uh, we see the, the dialogue is exceptionally broad because it does not necessarily fix any theme. But there's a tendency to, to, to have something fixed in one's mind and hearing, and, um, and it seems that the, the operation of, uh, of what I'm hearing with, through the screen of my background. Um, continues. It's very strong, and the tendency to, to interpret what's being heard seems to go on. And, and yeah, yeah that, that's so, of course. You see, we don't expect this to change in the spur of the moment. You see, uh, so the dialogue is unfolding, is showing what is happening, right? Now, see, uh, another point then. The uh, so suppose we say, uh, I would like to make a distinction here between thinking and thought. Right? Thinking takes time, you're consciously working it out. Now in thought it just happens, it's a disposition, right? either to act physically or to talk or to uh, develop further images or something. Right? See, thought is the past participle of to think, right? And uh, the, uh, therefore thought is the result of what has people have been thinking. And now, 
I want, um, thinking obviously is very important in certain areas when, when you're solving problems and so on. But I say in the dialogue, thinking is not terribly suitable. You see, it takes time. While you're at thinking, the dialogue is going on. <laughs> and uh, the, um, on the other hand, thought is perfectly all right. You might say thought gets in the way, but if, if thought comes out as a predisposition or reaction, and the dialogue is considering that, you see. You see that, therefore, the fact that it's thought is not doing, is, is really not, not doing any harm. In fact, it's showing up what all these things you're talking about, right? Hmm? Could you say that the brain, the dialogue is a form of brainstorming? Well, I don't know exactly what that is. It's a... Well, everybody putting out ideas, give and take back and forth with of opinions and, and understandings and, and suggestions and so forth. Uh, well, it might, might include that. I think it goes beyond that in the sense that uh, people are, uh, you know, uh, eventually they don't, you know, see, they, they learn to leave space, you know, for uh, assimilation for other people to come in, and it becomes, uh, to a certain extent, an art. It's more integrated than that, you see, that uh, when people really are in communication. Now, uh, the, uh, yes, uh, see, uh, uh, one thing I could say, one more point to say is the dialogue does not aim to solve problems, you see. It may consider problems and think, you know, discuss them or, you know, but it's not, not its aim, its function, to solve any problems. You see, the, the dialogue group is sort of this group which is empty at leisure. It has no... If you have problems to solve within a group, you set up another group, like a committee or whatever, to solve the problems, right, make decisions. Uh, <clears throat> but it's necessary to have in life somewhere, a, where a place where people can meet, where they have no problems to solve. They may always consider their problems, as I said there, but... They're not, don't feel obligated to solve them. There's no assumption that that is what you have to do. <laughs> There's no particular objective. Yes. But you see, solving problems is another way of looking at objectives, to say, usually an objective arises very often because you feel you've got a problem. Uh, now, and that has its place, you know, you can say, you, if you're running an organization or doing something together, you say, here we have certain problems, we must de decide what to do with them. But uh, in the context of having been able to talk without any objective, then there will be an understanding which would make it easier to deal with objective. Talking with someone yesterday, they were we were talking about meanings and what it meant by meanings, which was how this all began, I think. And um, this person, I can't exactly remember what they said, but there was this feeling that they felt that meaning were meaningless because we made them up. I think that's what they said. But what I said is what I heard being said here, and the basic premise I was operating on, is that meanings were making us up, not that we were making meanings up. And this person said, oh, well, I wish you'd ask that question to get it clarified. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yes, we're suggesting that the general meaning, which you know, is sociocultural in origin, is what makes us up. You know, each person may pick up different meanings of, out of the whole collection, you know, which is in the society. Like I said this word, idiosyncrasy, private mixture, that each person will gather together a private mixture of meanings which rules his life, right? It, it will vary with each person, but it comes from the general, the general collection, right? Meaning count is here, and we draw from it and arise out of the meaning. Yes, that's right. And according to the way we draw those meanings, that determines our character, you see, according to the assumptions which we accept. Right? Which are the premise on which we are operating here may, not, may be or may not be. Yeah, that's the suggestion. And You see, for example, if you say, my, my country means everything to me, that's really a very basic part of your character. If you say money means a tremendous amount to me, that's part of your character, right? You know, then you say that person is very much dominated by money, right? If you say, you know, if you say, you know, culture is very important to me, or something else is very important, you know, if, if something, according to what something means to you, and meaning includes value and, and it includes intention, right? 
your intention will form according to what it means, how valuable it is. And if you take the whole set of intentions, and values, and uh, 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 meanings, you see that is an essential factor of your being. Right? If it, it create those meanings, those create. Yeah, well, let, let's go. In different cultures, pe- things mean different things to people, and we have very, rather different sorts of people. Right? And uh, maybe deep down they're very similar, but at least, at least their character is different, right? So the um, uh, now, for example, in certain periods we discussed, uh, say Nazi Germany, where perfectly ordinary people, because of the meanings that were in that culture, they behaved in ways which they themselves would have regarded as outrageous be- before that happened, right? And therefore. You, uh, the same holds in every country. You know, you have mobs get together, and people who are perfectly ordinary in that mob can become uh, quite different, right? Because the meaning they take on the meaning of the whole mob, right? Which is very powerful. Uh, so uh, uh, the same holds. You see the difference between the West and the East. You see in the West, the, we say. Whatever this, this present system means a great deal, uh, and in the East another system means a great deal. You see, so more or less very similar people can be on the opposite sides of this uh, divide and uh, coming into conflict. Right. So what makes you uh, the sort of the meaning? Well, if you say none of these things mean something to me, or but something much deeper, then you have still another kind of being, right? This problem between the West and East, would a good stepping stone be to have dialogue rather than trying to confront their problems? Well, that, that's certainly true. You see, I'm saying that if you could ever manage to bring it about, you see that the, the, um, they've said they're having dialogues, but they're not, right? <laughs> so the, um, uh, see, if you began and say each one of us has got certain assumptions, right? And now, if we could listen to those assumptions in the spirit of the dialogue, holding them without judgment, just seeing what they are, then in that a common mind might develop. But you have such pressures and such fears and so on that that it's very much against setting this dialogue up. You see, I think if you had some people, like they said, there was once an occasion where two people, one from Russia and one from America, went for a walk in the woods, right? I can't remember the occasion, but so they began to talk more freely, and then something came out of it, but this was squelched as soon as it got into the uh, organizations, right? You see, once you have a hierarchic organization, dialogue becomes very difficult, right? You see, a hierarchy is against dialogue, is that clear? <laughs> and hierarchy has become the tradition of the human race uh, ever since our civilization began, let's say, 10,000 years ago. When we went from the hunter-gatherer to the agricultural society and bigger societies, where you could no longer have this small group dialoguing, <laughs> or you then had to form administrators and kings and priests, and uh, uh, now you can't have a dialogue in that situation. Right? The family itself became hierarchical, with the same kind of authority, and therefore there's no dialogue there. You see. You see, the, the traditional family was one where the patriarch ruled, right? So the question is, why do functional differences become hierarchical? What? Why do functional Well, I think this was because people didn't see any other way to do it, you see. See, suppose you, if you want to speculate about it, you have people went from the, the hunter-gatherer society, they, they, plant, they began to plant uh, for reasons that are unknown. There's one uh, idea that People knew about planting things for a long time and didn't do it. They preferred to live by hunting <laughs> and gathering. But possibly there was a shortage of food at some time and they had to plant. <laughs> then they said, well, this is good. We can be sure of our food supply. And they began to plant and spread it. And soon the population went up and they couldn't turn back, right? <laughs> so they had to plant more and more. And then the whole thing got very big, you see. They said, Who's, how can we run this thing? There's hundreds, thousands of people involved. You know, we've got to form small cities. We've got to have people running the thing, storing up grain. You know, uh, organizing it. And you see, the principle of hierarchy then gets set up, right? I think that 
thing that that, that principle of hierarchy was, um, <coughs> I'd like to bring up two points. <coughs> the principle of <coughs> hierarchy was probably there in, <coughs> in a way in the hunting society or gathering society also um, in terms of somebody did the hunting, somebody did this, somebody did that. Now, the, I think the problem comes from the confusion of <coughs> instead of, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over this room. Um, having a function, there's a certain function that everybody does in, in, within mm -hmm. a group of people, the whole society mm -hmm. itself. Everyone performs a certain function. Somebody is a cook, somebody is a gardener, somebody is, um, has gas, you know, serves gasoline, somebody collects garbage. The problem is you know, assigning a status to that function so that the function becomes on, on a question of, is, is then divided into this, this person is more, this function is more, this function is less. And in that division then, there is conflict and the meaning of the person becomes I mean, the, the meaning is then <clears throat> attached to a person who has status according to a function which that person, which is then seen as a possession. You know, I am a, um, a king or some, or I, no, I, I, uh, I, I'm a doctor, so, so this makes me more than other people in this, in that, not simply seen as a function, just doing, not separate from being, but as a, as having a status, which is then division. Yeah, well, there was some of that in the hunter-gatherer society, but it enormously increased when you went to the larger society. You see that the, uh, so, uh, the, um, you know, you had some special shaman and medicine man, or you had somebody who had this function or that function, but it wasn't that well, generally that well fixed. And even the chief, I was informed by some anthropologists, he was not actually running the tribe, his main function was to be a wise old man who would restrain the young braves from going to war, you see. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, see, the idea was that um, there was a far more, a number of anthropologists I know say that in that situation, people had enormously more freedom than they had later, that they, uh, although there were many disadvantages to it, but uh, the, uh, uh, in the sense, nobody really cared what you thought or said as long as you weren't too much of a nuisance. And then they would put you out of the tribe, <laughs> but uh, the which was a very serious thing. But the uh, uh, now, uh, but I, and perhaps we shouldn't dwell on this too long. That the yeah. Just going back a little bit off of this, you said uh, you know if, uh, if we came together and we suspended our assumptions and uh, then. Seems to me like you know, I put that in my mind and passed over it. But uh, to actually suspend assumptions, I mean, rather than thinking about mm -hmm. suspense, but to actually do that. Yeah, now you see, if, if we're, say, talking in the dialogue when people feel free with each other and trust each other, so whatever they say comes out, it's not premeditated, right? <laughs> you see, that uh, therefore the assumption can be come out, right? You see, one difficulty is by yourself, it's hard sometimes to know you've got the assumption. Right? You can look into it and find out. Uh, but another way is, uh, in the dialogue, uh, whatever you say is revealing your assumption. So you become a mirror for each other. Yeah. If, you don't, if you're not premeditating it, that, that is to say, covering it up, right? <clears throat> this morning I was thinking about something that came up yesterday that we're talking about assumptions, and we say, how do we know that our, that our, what we see about our assumptions, or we see, as we call the truth or whatever, isn't self-deception? I think that was mentioned several times, and I was thinking about self-deception, and I thought, well, the fear of self-deception creates this lack of action. If a person is always in this state of willing to say, this is an, always an assumption, then one is, doesn't worry about self-deception because they'll act, and if it turns out to be false, they'll keep moving. And in, under, in the action, you can only find out what's true or false. But I think that sometimes our brain is saying, well, I don't want to make any mistakes, and I definitely don't want to fall into self-deception. But the only way to find out <laughs> is to act. But if you're acting from the premise that this is all an assumption, you can't get caught in it. That was something that I thought. 
Yeah, well, that's this, uh, very similar to what I was saying, that if, uh, simply people will talk, uh, you know, without premeditation, when, uh, worrying about whether it's self-deception or not is a form of premeditation. Right? And uh, the, uh, but if you talk and just say you're talking, you're simply talking, right, then uh, the, the meaning will become clear to the group, to you, to other people, you know, as the exchange goes on. It seems there needs to be another element in there because we all have a lot of experience of just <coughs> talking. And uh, uh, the talk comes so quickly that I don't know if there's any room to see any assumption. Yeah, well, that, so saying in the dialogue, we're going to be talking, but you know, with, a, with a certain art of dialogue so that we're not jumping in too fast. You know, people will be learning that, you know, giving time for the thing to be assimilated, to sink in, and for other people to come in. You see, this very fast reaction is one of the things that comes from uh, what it means to you. You see that the it, it becomes, for some reason, it's, it's, it's important to answer very fast. Now, what could it be? What could be the reason we have to realize? Yeah. What's the assumption? If there's an answer that needs to be said. No, but there's a kind of urge to get in there, right? But why? Or that I'm being attacked. That's one possibility, yeah. Sometimes it's good to, from your question, to get your response up quick enough before someone else comes in and takes your thinking away or you lose your thought. That might be going on. Yeah. Why would you do that? But then if we are all moving more slowly and then that not, then ceases to be a serious problem. Well, if you if you speak uh, immediately and quickly, there's you can pretend that it's coming from the, some deeper thing that's the truth. Whereas if you pause and premeditate and consider it and uh, manufacture something to say, then you you don't have the same pretense that it comes from something uh, deeper and uh, more accurate. Yes. Uh, well, see, what I was saying is that this slowing down is not of the nature of premeditation, but it's a kind of silence, right? Hmm? Do you understand what I mean? Well, right now, the, I have the urge to talk, but I don't know what to say. I would like to ask, as a scientist, you said that meaning, if it's in the abstract sense, and it doesn't, uh, and, and, and there's no dynamic or action involved, as a scientist, um, there are meanings that are somewhat abstract, like pi, or e, or whatever. How, in your own, how does it lead somebody like yourself into uh, a deeper, more fundamental aspect of meaning that would uh, relate to the Germany question that you mentioned, and the the eminent problems that thought has brought upon. Uh, that we have brought upon ourselves by abstracting uh, thought to try to solve our problems, and yet there is great meaning in pi, in and of itself. Yes, well, there is an area of thought which can be abstracted, you know, re relatively independent, you know, which is in science and other areas, and uh, it's not entirely abstract because you're getting information from the world, and also it produces emotional effects, you see. If somebody is very interested in what he's doing, or he may also be defensive about his work in science, or you know, and the 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 thing is not entirely abstract, but it is relatively so. And uh, so you have a sphere of meaning. Let's say in pure mathematics, you have as an extreme example, you have a sphere of meaning which works in a very abstract level. It it has a certain contact with the rest of reality, but it's rather loose, right? I mean now. Uh, so there's a natural structure of thought, of logic, and so on, which I don't know, we haven't had time to discuss, of the concept, right? And uh, the... Uh, uh, now, the other point I want to make is that uh, 
we've been discussing the notion of a generative process, underlying thought, or underlying society, right? And unfolding into the uh, more concrete details. Right? Now, you see, the word generate, generate, uh, generate and general have the same root. You see, we use the word genus. You see, people who have the common um, origin are thought to be related you know, in the family or whatever. Uh, and and in, see, the, uh, the notion that the fundamental relation may be in the generative process is a common one right? in our history. Hmm? Now, uh, we could apply that not only to biology, but also to thought or to society, or to or more broadly still, to matter as a whole. And now, uh, you see, the word general, general has usually meant something abstract, you see. To, the general is, subsumes, as they say, the particulars. Yeah, to, the, the general is an abstraction which subsumes the particulars, but the particulars are regarded as the concrete reality. The general is an abstraction of what is common from all those particulars. That, that's one way of looking at it. An abstraction involves space, in the sense that it's in the act of abstraction there's a creation of place. Yeah, well, you br- from a concrete particular, and there is a creation of space. Now, the, it may not be uh, the correspondence; it may not be correct, but there is a creation of space. If it's not correct, it's a fiction that is created. Yeah, why do you say it's creating space? Because it's abstracting from a concrete reality. Yeah. Concrete yeah. Well, you see, abstract means literally to take out. Now. So you take out some feature from the concrete, uh, from uh, the various concrete particulars, and form the general, hmm? right. if they have that in common. Right. Now that we say has been taken out; it's abstract. Now the first feeling about it is that that's very insubstantial and mental. It's something in the mind. Huh? It may guide your action, you know, like, but it's something in the mind. Whereas the concrete particulars are there, being really real. Hmm? Now, but then I want to suggest turning this upside down. You know, to say in the generative process, the general is the most concrete. <laughs> the general, the, the deepest uh, f- feature of the generative process must hold for, the, for all, and then it gradually unfolds to the particulars. You see, like the tree growing from the root into the branches. Hmm? Well, let, let's take uh, life may have a generative process, you see, thinking of how uh, it starts, you say, for, uh, first of all, the most immediate thing, the plant starts from a seed. Now, the seed contains very little material or energy. The plant is actually made by the environment, not by the seed, right? Hmm? It's made from by the soil, the wind, the water, and the sun, the energy of the sun, right? Uh, the seed provides a pattern or information, according to modern genetics, uh, molecular biology, which uh, we can make a metaphor, it informs the environment to make a plant, right? <laughs> uh, previously, the environment was not informed, so it only made all more inanimate matter all, all, all over again, right? <laughs> mm. So, therefore, uh, we say the plant is generated, you see, from in this process. Mm. And then it will uh, produce more seeds, and it will decay, and it will fall back into the soil, and so on. So that whole thing I call the generative process. Now you can see a society works very much in that way too. You see that uh, the uh, uh, any organization starts from some somebody who has the idea of it, this, as it were, the seed of it, and uh, this is communicated to the rest other people around, and they all start to make the society. Now you see if you and what the idea means is the generative, that, that is a generative idea. You see, suppose you take General Motors, oh, well, here we have General in there too. <laughs> see, where is General Motors? You see, it's in the idea of General Motors, right? <laughs> if if uh, the notion of General Motors did not exist, uh, you know, we would have all the buildings and all the machinery, but nobody would know what they were supposed to be doing, and the, the thing would collapse, right? You see, so the whole thing is generated from an idea, right? That uh, the uh, see uh, is, uh, very much as the plant grew, you see, society provided the environment w- and the energy which produced this organization. But it could, the idea could have originated in one person, right? 
uh, or in a few. You think it's the ordering process that takes the random general, it orders all this random into a tree or into a car? Or yeah, or into an organization. You think that we're taking this disorder and ordering it, but you're saying that the order is ordering it. Yes, they order in the idea. You see, an, an idea, its root of the word is the same root as the, the Latin videre, to see. You see, a, an idea is a way of seeing. It becomes fixed later, you know, and may become rigid and so on, but the original idea was a sort of a perception of what, could, what was possible. Actually, the general could be the real and the, the original could be... The idea could be abstract, but then... But it's concrete, too. That's right. You see, the idea in its actual operation is concrete. You see, the the generative order is acting concretely to make the plant, the generative process, to make the organization, you see, to make the society. See, if if society had no generative order, it will degenerate. See, that's what happens to older societies. (laughs) Their order begins to fall. Their generative order begins to fall apart. You know, they, they break up. They, you see, it, it's, it's a, so we could say misinformation getting into the generative order, and making it break up. You see, the, so the older society gets, the more misinformation it accumulates. Much as if we go back to the human body, we, according to modern molecular biology, the, the key information is in the DNA. Now that may or may not be entirely true, but we could accept it for the sake of argument and say uh, the DNA contains information but it, that information does nothing it's the whole it's the cell that carries out the meaning of the information and in fact the cell doesn't exist by itself it never existed it's the environment <laughs> that has made the cell right so in some way the whole the, the, there's a generative order set up in the whole environment to make cells right or to make an organism you see that the general proceeds to the individual rather than the individual. That's another way of looking at it, yes. You see, saying in the generative process, the, the, the general proceeds to unfold to the more details. We always concentrate on the individual thinking. It, it, it directs us towards the general. General is just an average or something. Yeah. It's not an average. It's a thing that... that well, the, the general as process is concrete. Uh, you see, the general as an idea is very abstract, right? Yeah, as pure thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, as thought, the thought of the general is an abstraction, right? But we say that this abstraction, in in some cases, the general, if you put together a lot of um, a lot of qualities which are not very significant, the general, you see, is very abstract. But if you find something which is connected with the generative process, then this abstract idea points to the concrete generative process. You see what I mean? But hmm? that's just as concrete as the particular that is generated. Yes, well, but the generative process, in some way, the, the generative process is perhaps more concrete, but the, uh, the particular is an abstraction from that point of view. You see, see, the particular branch is an abstraction from the tree. The branch is really not a particular existing by itself, right? I guess a properly conducted dialogue can be considered a, a generative process. Yes. And what is the nourishment that it derives its source from? Like the seed derives its nourishment from the well, environment that it generates from the environment. What it generates. Well, it, it's the meaning, you see. It's a, the meaning of the dialogue, which uh, its significance, you know, its value, from which comes the intention to dialogue. Right? Is that energy or what? Well, you see, the, the energy is there here, you know, all the time, right? The energy of all the human beings, but it is going in all sorts of directions according to the various gen- the various orders or the various processes, which uh, meanings which have taken a hold, right? Now, if the dialogue is seen to be a very significant thing, you know, it will uh, have high value. It will liber- it will go liberate energy, and it will become your firm intention. <laughs> right? Is that clear? What I mean? See, instead of saying I have chosen to be to dialogue, you see what, what turns it around. You say saying there is me first here, who's the source of everything, 
and then I choose this or this or this. Now, then saying I, in my wisdom, have chosen to dialogue or not to dialogue, right? Well, I don't know if I can explain it a little differently, but when, when there is a intention which is generating here, and uh, it becomes high, high generation. It, it, the energy is very high level. Uh, it's not possible, it seems to me, to really see the extension. And the extension is vital to it. Because this generation, generating energy becomes a motion that misuses symbols <coughs> like uh, it doesn't have a structure for religion. You know, if it does, it has its own. So there is structure to almost everything we're trying to talk about. But if it's emotion we're talking about, which most people talk about, they really don't get together on the structure that, that that's similar. Well, I th yeah, I think that will come. You see, uh, I'm trying to say emotion is a part of the process of meaning. Emotion is an expression of meaning, and in turn, it's the source of meaning. Right? A further meaning, right? You see, uh, if you have a feeling of energy, it may do to be high value. You see, if you if you have a if something means something very bad to you, you will have a negative emotion toward it, right? Mm -hmm. That's part. Of, it's you see, as we say, the hormones carry the message uh, through to the body of the meaning of your thought, and the RNA, according to the theory, carries the message of the meaning of the DNA to the sites where prote proteins are made. So uh, the emotions are part of the message, you see. The, the but doesn't that cut? When the emotion gets too high, the concentration is totally on that, and hasn't. It doesn't cut off that emotion by anything that goes by. It doesn't see a friend that's there, or in other words, it's just totally encased in a cocoon. Yes, I, we have to discuss. This. That's a complex question. That the the emotions and the rest of the whole process are. In this generative process, <laughs> and uh, they can uh, see one of the pro problems of our traditional culture is that emotions and other features of our life are taken separately, such as thought and so on. Now, uh, this uh, this is to fragment things that are really one. Uh, now, the uh, uh, I think uh, if we want to discuss that, we could say if you watch. This would go to the question of being aware as an individual of how your mind is going. You see that we haven't emphasized so far the sociocultural question. We haven't paid much attention so far to the individual's question, but they really are bound together. And if there is time, we really have to consider both together. Now, the, um, yeah? Uh, I wonder now, these are... Uh, Serious question came to me uh, a few minutes ago in this dialogue. Uh, let us say three people are engaged in dialogue. Then all these three people have realized the limit limitations of thought, ideas, uh, conceptions. Then do, don't they experience or don't these three people come to silence rather than dialogue? Well, they may, yes. You see, the, the difficulty is that one has to realize the limitation of thought in a very, in a full sense of all the, the process by which meaning produces a, a, a disposition to act, to talk, to have emotions, you know, what we're discussing. You see, and also to conceal. You see, this whole thing is very much bigger than you see, one may abstractly realize all that you said, and still, the underlying process is not altered. Right? But the silence itself. If it what? Will, if it, the silence is real silence. It will reveal that process. It may, but you see, I think that if your assumptions are unconscious and are concealed, it may not. You see, that the experience suggests they may, that in a very large number of cases, people, after having gone through the silence, will react in much the same way with anger when something happens, you see. Therefore, we must say that the, it did not reveal the whole process. You see, as dialogue will help to reveal more of it, right? Uh, when you're by yourself, 
you can easily fool yourself, although not necessarily so. You see, if you're very sensitive and aware, then by yourself you can see this. On the other hand, uh, in relationship it comes out much more clearly. Uh, if we can manage to n not to get into confrontation and explosions and, you know, and anger and hate and all that. Yeah, that is that is a different um, realm you are talking about, <coughs> different from what I suggested, but I wanted to bring up. Uh, I would, more or less, I would repeat what I said. Let us say three people go on dialogue. Mm -hmm. Then all these three people have realized the dialogue is based on words, thoughts, concepts, ideas. And these three people have realized that these thoughts, ideas, words clearly uh, do not do much. They are limited, limited uh, realms of communication. Uh, that is where I am, my question arises. Then what happens? Uh, does silence prevail among these three? Well, I, I think you have to find out. You see, it, it may prevail. I, I think we can't say what will prevail. They may talk or they may, may not, you see. Uh, no reason why, if they have something to say, they shouldn't continue to talk. Uh, uh, I think that uh, seeing all that would mean the ending of conflict, you see. Uh, yes. Silence is not a result of conflict, yeah. but cessation of conflict. What? Yes, but I think conflict, uh, the cessation of conflict may take place while people are talking, you see. Talking is part of the silence. Uh, as it does not, silence does not exclude talking, but talking may exclude silence, you see, that uh, if it's in the wrong spirit. That is, uh, uh, si talking is as much part of reality as anything else. Silence doesn't exclude conflict either. If it were a false silence, it will allow conflict, but say if it were the kind he's talking about. Well, talking certainly allows us to appreciate the variety of life and the differences among us, and to, in other words, celebrate the, the great differences that there are. And there doesn't have to be conflict in order to appreciate the, the variety of things. Out of this great variety, uh, creation uh, feeds on that also, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you see, the problem is this, that People, talking is normal to people, you know, it's part of our whole structure, and, and society could not exist without it, and uh, the, uh, nor could we live without it the way we, you know, we couldn't function. Now, the difficulty is that in talking, uh, communication breaks down, conflict arises, uh, commonly, and we're saying in dialogue we are exploring that. <clears throat> uh, now, uh, I think that uh, when we are able to talk freely, you know, the conflict will reduce, right? It will go away. We will <clears throat> find the sources of conflict. Um, we will become aware of them. You see, that's one approach. Now, it's important that we be able to do this together. Uh, when we talk freely. Yeah. <clears throat> Seems to signify something which is Yes, well, what I mean is that in general people don't talk freely. It's part of the culture of our society that they don't feel, we, none of us feels free just to go somewhere and talk, or whatever's on your mind. Now, uh, the, uh, a great deal of experience suggests that it would be very un unwise to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, because of the nature of our society, right? Uh, if you, for example, were uh, living with people and you, you know, got to know each other and trust each other, then you might imagine a situation where you could say whatever was on your mind, right? It's still not apparent to me so. that uh, talking freely, see, you sh that tends to mean you say what's ever in your mind, right? Yeah. Okay, and then the other person says what's ever in their mind. Yes. And I respond to that. I yes. Now, what we haven't done, that's true, you see, what we haven't done is to work through that kind of, see, this dialogue is not going to come about without some conflict, you see, because of our whole background. Hmm. See, we haven't discussed that, but as all of us are going to be in the first stages of this dialogue rather polite to each other. <laughs> and that's, you pointed that out, I think, and maybe for me that's one of the most essential 
aspect of that type of dialogue is the, what you called impersonal friendship. Yeah. And I think uh, in everybody's life, that is probably the only occasion where that type of dialogue occurs is between friends. Mm -hmm. Because the whole nature of friendship is such, by definition, that there is no fear, that there is no yes. reservation, but you know that there is an openness, an open flow back and forth without a premeditation, without anxiety and reservation and so on. And to bring that about, of course, uh, one has to really break through all these barriers that are established through culture and through all the, well, custom of sorts, you know, like a particular form of politeness. Yeah. So that, 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 the way you use friendship, you see, the friendship may be, we've agreed that we don't discuss certain things and we keep it in certain areas. And yeah. uh, I don't I would, or I want to use. See, I want to define the meaning carefully. The way I want to use the word. You see, each of it. We can always change meanings according to whatever we need, right? And the uh, one meaning of friendship is just what you said, that we avoid things that disturb each other. But another meaning is that we don't necessarily do that. We don't jump in. But at a certain stage, if something is important, which is unpleasant, we still can say it to each other without an explosion, right? Would imply a capability for friendship. Yeah. Have. Well, you may have it. Everybody has it, but it may be blocked, right? You're, aren't you saying that in this process of dialoguing, there may be an explosion, and you have to work through that? Yes. Yes, but then it will be easier in the large group because when there's an explosion between two people, they confront each other, uh, like I was saying yesterday, and their very efforts to stop this often make it worse, right? Now, when there are other people in who are not quite that involved, they can come in in different ways and sort of keep the thing diffused to the point where we can confront this, or confront the wrong, where we can face this without uh, blowing up, right? Well, that can happen. Sometimes it happens that actually the nature of groups is to divide. That's and you true. Know, often gets that you actually get not just the two people, but the two people with the other groups That's polar behind them, but, and you get an actual polarization yeah. of the group. That's, that's one of the dangers. You see, I'm saying the, the, every, every situation has advantages and difficulties, right? Now, the individual has certain advantages and certain difficulties, but in the, in the group, you can polarize, and this is what's happened in the world between East and West, right? And other polarizations, religions. So, but then being conscious or aware of all that, we can say we have got to see that we don't polarize, you see, now, and I'm saying there is a way to, by which that can happen. Now, it's okay to say here that it seems to me that this division and this conflict occurs when, in a sense, I've lost my body. In other words, I'm so engrossed in what I'm thinking and where I'm going with my thinking that that takes precedence over everything, mm -hmm. and that thought is all. And so for this other thing to occur, it seems to me, uh, I have to have some notion that it's important to regard the whole situation rather than just what I'm thinking about. Yes, that's true. That's what we'll be learning. You see, that uh, as we start, we begin with the, the culture you know, which, which is around us, right? Which includes all that, those uh, problems. Now, uh, then, then we can be learning that this, uh, that this is what we need. You see that getting carried away by our emotions is not really called for, right? Uh, I mean, for getting carried away by your thoughts, right? But rather, that's one of the functions. As the group slows down and the, it, it doesn't build up to such a high temperature, then that carrying away will not happen so strongly. Hmm? So it's possible for a discussion to turn into a dialogue. Yes. So there's no sharp division, but you know, the, the, one of the ideas is it's either this or that, but that's an assumption. Is there a difference between communication and dialogue? Well, dialogue is a kind of communication, but you see we have all kinds, you know, some of which are very restricted. I mean, for example, the East and West are communicating with threats. See, uh, the the word communicate well, means make it really common. Union with. Yeah, well, to, to make it common in some way. But the, uh, uh, you see, uh, 
you could say politics is an attempt to communicate, right? Basically, hmm. people have got to politics is people's attempt to com communicate and come to a common policy. Hmm. And there's a fellow called von Clausewitz who said war is the continuation of politics by other means. In other words, when when communication breaks down, you try to communicate to the enemy that you are stronger than he is by demonstrating that that he's got to do what you want, right? Uh, see, uh, or politics has broken down. Uh, right? uh, they attempt to discuss. Uh, politics should really be dialogue. Hmm? It, it seldom is, but <clears throat> if you see, policy should be determined by people who are in dialogue. But uh, the uh, uh, but instead it becomes confrontation and eventually war. Now, even war is a kind of communication. Right? <laughs> Conflict is a spatial separation. Even if you took this group and divided it in half and people talked in two different rooms, it's probably just a mild form of polarization. And, uh, you know, when you have the East and the West, the fact that people are separated, you know, interferes with any type of dialogue. Well, uh, that all is one of the problems of the size and so on. But, uh, you see, uh, I think that this group is just a little big for... Uh, <coughs> getting started, some group between 20 and 40 would be more convenient. See, in fact, the smaller groups are really almost about the right size for starting a dialogue. I think it was Friday night, you said something about, or alluded to, um, something about uh, dialogue and communication may be the same thing. Um, I, was, I was thinking that... Um, if two more people are are uh, uh, talking and uh, with uh, uh, comparatively clear perception of what is, then uh, then it is the same thing. And it, and it's like um, there's little need for for usual kind of explanation um, for a lot of things. It's like. Um, um, is more of a, a kind of an indicating than than a lot of uh, explanation. Yeah, it will be more implicit, you see, and uh, that, that's what I was saying about these under gatherers, according to the anthropologists, that they would talk about all sorts of things that seemed to have nothing to do with anything, but they were sort of it was implicit. Much more was implicit in it, right? Well, when they were talking and in a dialogue, uh, what? that then determines whether something is true. Uh, because in, in a, a society where everyone is homogeneous, um, you would assume that uh, you're all, like in a fundamentalist uh, religion or something, you all agree that uh, this is what's true. And you get a little bit more diversity of, of uh, backgrounds, and, and then uh, you get more of a conflict of, of meanings and of ideas, but when you have a dialogue, where is the ring of truth? How do you recognize yeah. something which is, is false and something which is Well, that, that's a very difficult, subtle question. You see, we were discussing yesterday that truth is not just in the content or in the correctness of the thought, but truth is in the straightness of the whole process, right? And the untruth is the non-straightness, which is uh, the deceptiveness, the self-deception. You see, if you're worried about thinking about self-deception, that's the sort of question you're in. You see, to say, is the process straight? Is it aiming to conceal what's really there? Or is it aiming at some object which is not what it's saying it's doing? And, uh, the, uh, uh, now, I think that there, people have used the word the ring of truth. It suggests that we get that feeling of this truth or straightness of the process from some level other than verbal analysis. <coughs> and... Uh, Otherwise, the feeling of truth, you know, some people have said it smells right, or, <laughs> you know, they're using it metaphors, right? Mm, it rings true. Uh, that, that can be deceptive, too, but uh, there's no guarantee in this. As I said, even if you want to make money, there's no guarantee that you will make it. <clears throat> and this is even less guaranteeable. So the, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, but there is a possibility for that feeling uh, of truth or falseness, right? That is, it, it may ring false, you see. 
uh, now then you have to look at it and uh, you know begin begin to examine it if, and see if, you know if you get a feeling of its falseness. Would you say correctness is a process on that, or just truth? Well, the correctness is a feature of truth, but the, the process may be true, but it may be momentarily have an incorrect uh, statement in it, but then it's moving toward being corrected. But a statement may be correct, but part of an untrue process. It's possible for good to come out of falsity, and not in the, to come out of truth. No, it? in the long run, I don't think any good will come of falseness. In the long run, good could only come out of truth, and truth could only come out of what is good, right? <laughs> or truly good. It's absolute. Well, as far as I can see, yes. You see, I'm proposing that. Uh, I mean, that's all. Any that statement could always be questioned, but I'm saying that's what I see at, at the moment. I have um, a question that's very difficult for me to articulate. Maybe I could get some help. Um, we are all personal or self-conscious um, people who are coming to hear that uh, dialogue is important. And we may hear as an idea, because that's, we haven't experienced it, that that's more important than the individual. And then this individual is sitting here, listening to this, and even excited by the idea, and yet um, the me has, for the many years I've been alive, so, so, um, uh, it's, it's so strong that the idea, when it actually gets down to trying to be quiet and listen, doesn't want to because the the um, there hasn't been a display that dialogue is more important than me, even though the idea mm -hmm. is absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. So then um, I I'm noticing right here, you know, I, I'm trying to listen, and then I hear my wanting to say this question, which is the me. It may sound like a, a, a question that's that's interesting or not, doesn't matter. Um, but it's not coming from listening because as things were going on, I was not quietly listening. I have reactions and I'm coming up with all these things that seem like it's going on with the conversation, but it's not. Okay, so I do get the dilemma I'm speaking of. I do not. I'm it's real good, Nadia. <laughs> yes, well, does anybody want to chime in on that? I think. It may be coming from, um, from the dialogue. I mean, what I hear you saying is that it, it, it's not coming. Uh, no, I feel it's coming for me because I was thinking about, you know, you talk about thought. I was thinking about, I couldn't get it in my mind, but I had this feeling, and I wanted to get it out, and I couldn't hear what was going on, and I watched that, and then it would go back to wanting to say this because to, it, it's important to me. Mm -hmm. So this me is now um, uh, dominating, and I'm not being quiet. Okay. So why do you feel there's something wrong with that? You're right, exactly. Well, because the I is so strong that we, our society has, has invested in, in, in the individual and, and that, that even though we hear the importance, we hear that as an idea. I don't know how many times one has actually experienced how unimportant this me is. Isn't it important to let that disposition come out and it as dispositions come out, that becomes the foundation for dialogue. Yeah. And okay. that we can all hold those dispositions without conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think she just demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She did. That's the problem. If you didn't have the idea that there was something wrong with the eye. I'm, I'm not saying wrong, it's interfering. Well, it's whatever you have, I'm feeling that there's some kind of conflict between what's happening which you say is an idea, and another idea, that, and you feel it's one idea should be subservient. I don't understand. If you didn't have all these ideas, you wouldn't have all these conflicts. And then we could sit here and see what's happening. See, I'm not, I'm not listening to your question right now, because I have an answer already in mind. Fine. Okay. Right. Well, then we're not talking to each other. So, that, so I, that's exactly where dialogue doesn't happen. I'm watching the fact that as you're saying it, I heard something and I want to respond to that. And so then... That well, can't be. But see, you didn't respond to it. You put something in the middle that says, I should be listening to his question. That's what I'm saying. Mm. 
See, if you'd have just said, oh, no, that's all a bunch of baloney, we'd be dialoguing. Right. I'm but you didn't do that. Though. You put something in Adobe stuff. No, I'm trying to see. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Because what the, what the, the re spontaneous response, well, that's just a bunch of baloney. Is that dialoguing? Mm. Well, it would be much closer to dialoguing than her having a dialogue with herself saying, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Would, At would, least we'd be communicating. Would you, you, you stop concealing? <laughs> Well, no, that's she's what I'm... put it. She's made it public for us all uh -huh. to look at. So it was said she has brought it out for us. Right, and I yeah, asked her why she had that. Well, I felt that she was saying there was this separation, and she says I'm not listening to what you say because I'm always thinking about your answer. I says, and then I'm thinking about my thought about the answer, and I'm saying, well, why didn't you just think about the answer? I think it's just reacting because she's not listening to what you're saying. <laughs> no, I'm reacting because she's not. Letting what she's thinking out. So we all do this. Well, fine, I'm reacting. If I didn't react, I wouldn't read it. I think at this point, the problem is trying to have a dialogue in a group this it's, it's, my, my theory is she may not have been finished. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I think uh, it is a problem of fragmentation. If the dialogue, if you see a division between dialogue and I, there is this conflict and fragmentation and uh, back and forth difficulty. Uh, but if you see as a whole, there is no this, there is no room for that kind of conflict to arise. Yes, I understand. Yeah, well, uh, yes, I think uh, there are several interesting points in this whole discussion. You see, that's one, and uh, I'll come to it. Uh, see, the other is that uh, you could see the emotional temperature beginning to rise, <laughs> which is really the beginning of the process. You see. <laughs> That, you see, if we don't go through that, not, not that we seek it on purpose, but if we don't go through that, then uh, we will not be able to be friends, right? Right. Uh, no. Jason, I thought that when uh, you were speaking, almost uh, as you started to speak, that uh, I had a sense that you, you were exposing yourself in, in a way. Right. And, um, and my feeling throughout what you were saying was that it was right to use a word. Um, and something was being revealed. And we all do that, I think, with mm -hmm. what you were talking about, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's... See, my question is, where do we, where do we make that step beyond that? We well, all have this I that wants to jump in, and in spite of the, the knowledge that what we're talking, that dialogue is important, we, we now, uh, we have value to a degree, but the yeah. value of me is stronger. It has come first for 41 years, and it's going to take a lot of work to to see that the value of this group is more important than well, me. I mean, to experience that. Well, that may be a set of assumptions. You see, the uh, the uh, see what, what, one point was just remarked. You know, this separation. What? Yeah, no, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, the. Uh, the See, I, in the dialogue, I think we are neither in the individual nor in the group, but we're moving between them, you see. The, uh, yes. and now, and I would like to say, perhaps you could say a human being has three dimensions, the individual dimension of his own life, the dimension of sociocultural, and what we could call, for want of a better word, the cosmic dimension, which religion has concerned itself with philosophy and to some extent science and possibly other things. And uh, the, uh, we haven't mentioned the cosmic dimension here. We're primarily concerned so far with the sociocultural because that has been the one dimension which has been highly neglected, I think, in our culture, in the whole of culture. And the, I mean, and the, um, but we, you see, this, the individual and the uh, sociocultural are not necessarily in conflict, but uh, see, the sociocultural doesn't mean suppressing the individual. Uh, they may flow into each other uh, so that we may focus on the individual or on the group, and, you know, it moves back and forth. But uh, I think what you're referring to is a, another problem that how the individual or how the self has become so dominant, and uh, which is part of a vast culture and history. And uh, uh, that I don't know if we can discuss, you know, if we want to, we could discuss it later, but uh, the, uh, that has to do a lot with the way our, our thought goes. And, but I think we, just for the moment, you know, since we can't go into that in this moment, uh, the, 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 we would say that we, 
it would, it would not be right to set up this opposition between the individual and the group, but the saying group is more important or less important. But really, uh, there should be a, a situation where the human being can develop or unfold in all of the different dimensions. And we're, for the moment, considering, say, the individual and the socio-cultural dimension. The other one, we may not have time to really get into very far. Uh, all of them are very difficult questions and uh, require a lot of discussion. What? Yeah, we might later do it. I think this time, yes, we'll try it. Perhaps we could try to get into that. Uh, but I think that we need all three of those dimensions, you see. And, and our experience of humanity suggests that all three are needed, right? Because that has been present far into the past. Right? Uh, there's the individual, and, and, you know, which the, the person. And then there's the socio-cultural dimension and the cosmic. Uh, and see, perhaps early man was in direct contact with nature very often, and he had that sense of cosmic dimension in his daily life. When, when that went away, the people had to develop religion and philosophy and, to some extent, science to try to bring that back right, in another way. One thing I heard uh, was we all, we all respond from I am, uh, uh, come out of come these responses from I, ego, or something like that. But I think uh, that may not be quite true. That may be an experience of an individual, but that, that may not be true as far as this group is concerned. Yes, yeah, so why is it not true? Um, I think there may be people uh, who see the dialogue itself as as I rather than a, a division between dialogue and mm -hmm. so called so called I. Yes, that may be. And see, uh, perhaps I would make one more point, but I think we had agreed that we were going to have a break, so I'll just make one point. Uh, see, this word I requires a tremendous investigation, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, one point is, you know, it, it has a tremendous meaning, you see, and a tremendous power. Now, it has all sorts of meanings, you see. One question is, what does it mean, you see? Now, if you say, I, see, usually a person feels that he's some ends at his skin, he's somewhere inside the skin, right? But if you take a blind man who is tapping with his stick and holding it tightly, he has the feeling that he ends at the end of the stick, which is loosely connected to the room, you see. And he's learning about the room from the end of the stick, which is him. If he holds the stick loosely, he ends at his fingertips. Or he may think, anybody may think, I'm going to move my arm, so he thinks I'm somewhere in here moving my arm, which is something else. Or on the other hand, you can go outward and say, I am identified with my country. I end at the boundaries of my country. Or you can say, I am the whole cosmos. Uh, right? These are different ways of experiencing. Or coming inward, you could say, removing more and more, finally say, I'm a tiny little point. <laughs> <laughs> right in the very middle, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, or else eventually, if the point goes, you could say, uh, "I am nothing." Right. So the um, uh, the uh, therefore, this meaning of the word "I" is very uh, variable according to the circumstance, and therefore, "I" could uh, not necessarily exclude the group. If we say "I," whatever it means, it means the active, uh, you know. Um, that active movement of the mind which determines meaning and so on. And therefore, that could be the group, right, for a certain moment. Then individual could be in another moment, or, you know, as we separate and so on. See, so uh, this word I, see, this notion that I has a fixed meaning, you know, is not, not true, you see, that uh, I can mean a tremendous number of things. And at a certain moment, we may say that the source of, of mind, of meaning, and so on, is the whole group. Now, when you say I, personally, that's exactly what you mean, that the source of meaning is in here, right? That, namely, the source of intent, of meaning, of significance, of intention, of value, is somewhere in here. You see, the I is really meant, but what is meant by that is that, I think, you see. That uh, it's the subject. <laughs> And saying that there is a conflict between the I and the group is 
the conflict. Yeah, it creates the dwelling the, on the conflict is the conflict. Yes, that's right. It's a self. Uh, is furthering the conflict. Yeah, if you do it that way, that is, it's a self-fulfilling assumption that there is this division. Now, it may be that it has been there. We have already held that assumption, but then holding it more firmly will make it worse. Huh? 